if you train the system with only one set of data, it will become biased. And with that bias, you will then make errors. So again, we've been very careful about the ethics of the AI being applied and making sure people really understand what we think we know and what we know we don't know. I'm Tony Long, I'm the CEO at Global Fishing Watch. Our audacious project is to map all human activity out at sea. Hi, I'm David Gruber. I'm the president and founder of Project SETI, the Cetacean Translation Initiative. Our audacious mission is to listen to and translate the communication system or language of sperm whales. There's not that many humans that really spend much of their life in the ocean because we're terrestrial. And I think, you know, you see the changes and I've seen them, especially going underwater and setting coral yeah. reefs. I mean, I, I, it's like a tragedy what's going on beneath the waves and being able to measure and monitor like you are overfishing is, is key conservation issue, absolute key. And I'd love to just hear more of like, uh, you know, how you got into this and some of the tools that you're applying to, to address this. Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, overfishing is a huge problem. Illegal fishing is a huge problem. I think it's, it's talked about now at just about every convention, congress, workshop, uh, internationally. What we've got to do though is make sure this information gets into the hands of the people that need it. It can't just be like one organisation looking down on the ocean telling people what's happening. It needs to be an interactive, it needs to be a collaborative. So it needs the broader international community to recognise that and bear down on those people that are taking more than they should be taking. So, you know, our organization is using artificial intelligence or advanced machine learning, um, you know, tools that have actually been around for, for many decades, but now have really come to the forefront. I'd love to hear more of uh, how are you using AI and in what ways are you using this to, in, in Global Fishing Watch? Yeah, the, the AI is a really important factor um, in order to scale. So we, we're using the training data sets. You know, we, the, the way the fishing vessels operate out on the ocean, we, so we can see the patterns. Satellite data, right? Yeah, satellite yeah. data. So if you there take that, those models and train the machine, it can then spot those and it will get better and better at spotting those different fishing patterns. How do you make this transparent for, for the world to see? So this word transparency is really important. Uh, what does it really mean? It, it means about being clear about what's happening out on the ocean. So a lot of the data associated with the industry or with national governments tend to be a little bit hidden. It's a bit proprietary. Thinking in the past, everyone felt that that protection of that data was the key thing. What I would argue is that the release of that data is the more powerful thing. That having the confidence to release the data and hold other people to account by sharing and showing what's in this one ocean community, that's the thing that makes it scalable. The technology is there, it can happen, and in the next three years we'll deliver that. I love that. You're three years into your project and, and a, you've got a lexicon running. I think you've got an alphabet now. So how did you get there and, and where's it going next? When we first started Audacious, um, it was a lot of like, what animal do we start with? Mm -hmm. um, what non-human would we start with? And we chose the, the sperm whale for, for, for many reasons. Um, one, it's got this 18 pound brain, highly yeah. encephalized. It, uh, males and females communicate with these coda systems. We began to kind of like approach this from all angles. And early on, I think we were, we were just kind of finding like how much information could be carried in these Codas, and um, and now we've kind of gotten to the step where, in theory, a lot. Yeah. We're trying to train the computer to be a baby whale, mm -hmm. you know, and to it can't just learn it. You can't just like take something where there is no data and have the computers learn it. AI, as you know, you need that visual data. You need all that information of satellite data before it could start finding patterns but hinting to like a sperm whale phonetic alphabet. Wow. Hinting to that they show signs of language closer to humans than any other species yet. Um, and we're just beginning. Yeah. Is there an ethical question here as well? So we've talked about AI that's raised different things and you're making this data open. Do you think there's, there's an area where it could be used for ill-gotten gain? How do we avoid that? I think that's the million dollar question with, with everything right now and I think it's, uh, you know, there's some interesting examples, you know, the same thing with CRISPR or gene therapy. Um, you know, these are things that need to be approached with care 
There needs to be discourse and dialogue around it. I don't think we should take the, the tech perspective of just move fast and it, you're gonna break some eggs to make an omelet. Um, you know, we're being really careful, really thoughtful. There's one way to validate understanding is to use playback studies. Mm -hmm. Being really careful. Before we move to playback studies, do we really understand what we're doing? Do we know? Um, and I think that, you know, kind of having this run by a nonprofit led by scientists, led by people that are so care about these animals, you know, makes all the difference in the world. You know, it's kind of up to us deciding how do we want to use it. And I'm curious about you, you know, what are some of the, the key issues that you're kind of seeing now or the, the key ethical areas around your work? Yeah, it's a similar, it's a similar set of questions in the sense of uh, where open data should be um, and, and does open data cause more problems than it solves in that sense. Some people have said if you're going to make all this information available to where the fishing vessels are and, and, and potentially where the fish are, isn't that going to help those that want to fish illegally? Which is a, you know, an obvious question to ask. Within our public system, we anonymize the data to a degree. So it's redacted, so not all of the information is in the public system. It's aggregated, so we, we bring a lot of data together. And we also delay it by a few days in order that what's actually public isn't immediately useful to anyone who looks straight at the map. You need to look at more. But the other point is the people who are fishing are using technology as well. So they know exactly where the fish are. We're not giving them any more information than they already have. So it's a, it's a bit of a question used to try and divert where we might be going with open and transparent data that will deter that bad behavior and, and actually bring a scalable ocean solution. So yeah, we, it's always hard to keep up with the bad guys, so to speak, in the sense of where they are, but the open data will really bring the pressure down from a sense of deterrence, but also hold us accountable. So I'm kind of like thinking that our real world application is just transforming our relationship of who we are, the power we hold, and where we can go. You know, I feel like the book is still to be written and how we make decisions now are, are really important to kind of set the pace in which we, we apply these new tools.